this is Karin Zesas of ASCOA Online. As you may know, Guatemala has an election coming up on June 25th. But what you might not know is that voters have almost two dozen candidates to choose from. As the country faces corruption, malnutrition, insecurity, and the effects of climate change, voters are looking for someone who may be able to turn the tide. Some top contenders include Thelma Cabrera, an indigenous leader who, well, not her, she was disqualified. But there's Roberto Arzu, the son of a former president who, well, wait, actually, he's also been disqualified. But there's definitely conservative businessman and frontrunner Carlos Pineda, right? No, he was disqualified as well. Sancionar al señor Carlos René Pineda Sosa, candidato presidencial del Partido Político Prosperidad Ciudadana. Me quieren sancionar por haber entrado de oyente a una actividad pública. What's going on? How can the country's courts keep eliminating candidates from running? The move to bin these candidacies has proven controversial, and many have called it a symptom of democratic backsliding. Our guest today is on the front lines when it comes to covering the trend. We have candidates who are independent, who are pro-democracy, and who really have very few chances to to win the election. But there are three that might be very dangerous for those who are governing right now. And these are the three that have been eliminated. That's Juan Luis Font, a veteran journalist from Guatemala who has been forced into exile but continues to report from the United States about his country's politics with Con Criterio, a multimedia news and debate platform. Journalists, along with civil society activists, prosecutors, and judges, have been targeted for fighting corruption and impunity, particularly in recent years during the presidency of Alejandro Jamate who, by the way, can't seek re-election. Now, Font says, the powers that be are also pushing aside less preferred candidates. So who are the hopefuls still in contention? Well, there are lots, but among the leading ones are Sandra Torres, a former first lady who holds sway over one of the country's largest political parties, Edmund Mulet, a former congressional leader and UN diplomat, and Zuri Rios, a longtime legislator and the daughter of a now deceased dictator. Oh, and and there's also Manuel Conde of the ruling Vamos party, though he's not polling all that well. What we are having right now in Guatemala is a very big confrontation between an alliance of those who are uh, in the government. They are just for impunity and for corruption. On the other hand, there are a few candidates that really want democracy to go over in the country and would like to have a a republic back in Guatemala. In this episode, Juan Luis Font spoke to me about the state of the country's election and democracy, who the contenders will be in an almost certain August runoff, and why, amid a pessimistic view of the country's outlook much of Guatemala's youth looks up to Salvadorian President Naib Bukele. You're listening to Latin America in Focus. Latino America in Foco. America Latina in Foco. A podcast by America Society, Council of the Americas on politics, economics, and culture in the region. Thank you so much, Juan Luis, for being uh, with us today. It's a pleasure to have you. And I want to start out by saying this is a very complicated election to understand for those who haven't been paying close attention. Top candidates have been disqualified. Um, There are close to two dozen candidates who are competing. Uh, You recently opened a column on Con Criterio by saying The current electoral process is the most vacuous and emptiest of substance that the country has experienced since the beginning of the shift to democracy. And it's also the most uncertain. Those two things go hand in hand. 
I'm wondering if you could tell our listeners a little bit more of the electoral context and why you framed it that way. Well, I, I really find this is vacuous because uh, the candidates are not really discussing the real things, the, the things that really matter to most of Guatemalans. Let's start by saying that Guatemala is a country where 60% of its population lives under uh, poverty. When I mm. say these kind of figures, maybe people doesn't get the, the whole story. I'll tell you this. One out of every two kids in Guatemala is chronically malnourished. That means that he is not going to develop. He has a, a big chance of not developing his mental capacities at all. So mm. that's, that's very sad. And the Guatemalan government, the Guatemalan state, doesn't fight against that malnourishment. Why is so? Because most of our politicians and, and our presidents, they have been uh, devoted, I have to say, to corruption. One of the strange things about this election is that um, certain candidates have been disqualified, uh, including three big players. Um, most recently, we saw Carlos Pineda, uh, who uh, was framing himself as, a, as an outsider candidate. And he was actually leading some of the polls. And the Constitutional Court finally ruled it on May 26th that mm -hmm. he, he can't run. And then we had uh, Thelma Cabrera, uh, an indigenous leader who was eliminated earlier, as well as Roberto Arzu, uh, the son of a former president. Can you talk a little bit about these disqualifications? Why have so many candidates been eliminated in this election? What we are having right now in Guatemala is. Um a very big confrontation between uh, an alliance of those who are uh, in the government and some parties that have helped them uh, keep power in the last four years. They, they are just for impunity and for corruption. They have the control over all of the institutions. I mean, uh, the, the courts, the Attorney General's office, and they simply want to keep it for the next four years. On the other hand, there are a few candidates that really want democracy in the country and would like to have a, a republic back in Guatemala. We have candidates who are independent, who are pro-democracy, and who really have very few chances to, to win the election. But there are three that might be very dangerous for those who are governing right now. And these are the three that have been eliminated. At the mm -hmm. beginning, Telma Cabrera, who is uh, uh, at the front of uh, peasants and indigenous coalition. This is a very interested movement. They really want to finish with the Guatemalan system, with the political system. They want to they want to start uh, over with a new constitution. They would like to have an organization, an organization in the country that is based on indigenous traditions. And on the other hand, there is Roberto Arzu. He is, uh, I would say, a bourgeois. He's a person who comes from a very rich and politically famous family in Guatemala. His father was a very conservative president in the country, but he finds that um, he really has to fight against the system that we have now. And then there is this guy, um, and supposed to be outsider, Carlos Pineda, who suddenly made himself very popular through TikTok. Con Carlos Pineda haremos historia and who became a real uh, great challenge for, for the system. And they simply had to block him. Perdimos ante un sistema fallido, un sistema cobarde que no se animó. Just a month before the elections, and it really looks like they have been manipulating the system, the, the process throughout the whole campaign and throughout the whole elections. Yo rompí el esquema. Les toca a ustedes continuar. 
you know, I, I want to talk about who actually is in the race too, but I think this is a, a, a good moment to stop and to, you know, put some more context on this. Some of the things that you've talked about, you know, it's been a very challenging time for uh, Guatemala's democracy. Um, we've seen recently the closure of a, of a major uh, publication, El Periódico, and the imprisonment of its publisher, Jose Rubén Zamora. Uh, and we've seen in recent years dozens of prosecutors who have been trying to battle corruption forced to even leave the country. And and you yourself are covering Guatemala in exile. I'd love if you could share a little bit about your experience and, and how you're seeing this, because it happens at this time that there is a shift from a few years ago when Guatemala seemed like a regional trailblazer in terms of battling corruption, when it even forced the resignation and, and arrest of President Otto Perez Molina. I'm curious, can you tell us how we went from that moment to this one where uh, journalists like yourself uh, are leaving the country? We're having the backlash of that fight against impunity and corruption that was led by a United Nations Commission. And right now, the people that is in power is, is very concerned about uh, sending out either out of the country or to jail to all those prosecutors, judges, magistrates, and journalists who supported and, and operated that fight against impunity and corruption. And what we are having right now is a retaliation from those who were taken to jail, to trial, throughout at least three years, uh, where, where impunity was, was combated in Guatemala. And even though there are so many candidates on the ballot, there are a few candidates uh, that are rising to the top of the polls. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about them and their background. We have Sandra Torres, we have uh, Edmond Mulet, and then we have uh, Zori Rios. Can you tell us a little bit more about these candidates and how you see this race shaping up? Well, I see that Sandra Torres is a traditional like, Guatemalan politician. She has been very clever to organize her political party, and, and she has been a strong candidate in the last two elections. <laughs> However, she has a lot of opposition, and whenever she gets to, to the ballotage, to the second round of, of the elections, she gets to lose the battle. So. Mm -hmm. um, she has a lot of power in the country because she gets a lot of parliamentary members um, elected every every general election. And he, she has been, for instance, uh, a good ally of actual uh, president, uh, Mr. Yamate. So she has also been persecuted because of, of corruption, but she has been granted many facilities. And, and right now she's simply one of those uh, favorites to win the election. Suri Rios is also a very traditional candidate, and, and she's also run for the for at least three times. She has faced uh, legal challenges because the Guatemalan Constitution prohibits the family of those who have been on top of a coup d'état to look for the presidency. Gran potencial de crecimiento económico, pero los altos índices de criminalidad son un impedimento para lograrlo. Por ello, enfrentaré la inseguridad con carácter. Even though she has been uh, granted permission to be a candidate this time by the, by the Guatemalan court. And she is, I would say, like the favorite of the big capital in, in Guatemala, of, of big money. On the other hand is uh, Edmond Mulet, who has also been a very traditional politician, uh, a center-right politician. However, since he has also been an undersecretary uh, general of the United Nations. He is a diplomat who considers important the, um, the recognition and, you know, being positively viewed by, by international community. And he seems to be a little bit more in favor of respecting human rights and, and democratic principles in the country. I think those are the three main candidates, and, and one of them is going to, two of them are going to the ballotage, and, and I guess most probably it is going to be Sandra Torres and Edmond Mulet. We also have an 
the, the official candidate that is Manuel Conde, uh, it would be a very big surprise if he ever gets to the ballotage. Hmm. It's it's something that's interesting about Guatemala that um, in spite of the fact that, you know, as you mentioned, there have been certain familiar names in leadership, uh, the incumbent party has never won consecutive elections. And since the return to democracy, there's never been a candidate that won in the first round. Looking at the polls, the candidate who gained the most with Carlos Pineda dropping out was Edmund Mulet. Uh, Sid Gallup released a poll that showed him gaining seven points, and that actually appears to, um, as you suggested, push him to be in a good position uh, to be in the runoff. Uh, meanwhile, Zoririos only gained three points from that. I- I'm curious what you think about these polls, how much stock we should put in them. Well, I think that polls are not 100% reliable, n- n- not in Guatemala, not everywhere. Mm-hmm. We could simply look at them as a reference. And I think that in this case, they are a very good reference in terms that Mr. Mulet is gaining more support from those former voters or potential voters of Mr. Pineda because he seems to be the one that is, uh, let's say, more independent from the the incumbent, from the government right now. Mm-hmm. And and I think that Suri Rios is it's really been under a very big challenge throughout the whole campaign because she has very easily reached her peak at mm. 20% of uh, support on those polls. And she has never been able to grow out from that support. And she has been descending from 20 to 18 to 17. Mm. So I think that um, it, it looks like she's not able to, to get any more support than she's got so far. That's why we think that um, either uh, Sandra Torres or Edmond Mulet are going to get to the ballotage and, and one of them is going to get elected. And most probably is Mr. Mulet. The question for us is, is Mr. Mulet going to be a president, a pro-democracy president, or is he going to become also an authoritarian uh, president who is going to rule with uh, the support of the courts and Congress and Attorney General? And is he going to keep this persecution against those who who fight against corruption and and impunity? Hmm. Is that for you one of the unknowns of this election? I would say that is the main unknown of the election. I really think the election is between democracy and a real Republican way of organizing the country, and on the other hand, uh, against authoritarianism in a country that simply doesn't have any balances at all, and which concentrates all the power in the presidency and allows the politicians and the functionaries to use the public funds uh, to their will and not in the sense of, uh, of working for for the people. Listen, there are many things in Guatemala that really need to be well done. I'm Mm. not only talking about fighting against malnourishment, but we also have a very very poor uh, educational system in the country. We also have a very weak public health system in the country. We have at least 4 million Guatemalans out of 18 million inhabitants that have fled the country and have come over to the United States to look for a better way of living. Do you think that couldn't be changed if Mm. we had uh, uh, authorities who would really look for the well-being of most of the people and not only just for the well-being of a few? You know, talking about that and and about Guatemalans uh, emigrating, leaving home, uh, heading to the United States, what role do you see the United States playing in some of these challenges in Guatemala, both now and, and with an incoming government? So I think the United States plays, plays a very ambiguous and ambivalent role. I mean, on one hand, they support democracy and they criticize the, the persecution of former attorneys, of journalists, or of former judges. On the other hand, they allow the government to do many things 
without criticizing or without um, imposing any sanctions because they also want to have a good relation and they want the government to help them not to have that big migration. And then the country is in the middle of the way of Mexico and the rest of Central America. So most, most of migrants who come from South America and Central America go across Guatemala. Washington is not going to impose sanctions on democratic Guatemalan uh, key players because of they think that um, it could be very expensive in political terms. Mm -hmm. Speaking then a little bit about Guatemala's role in the region, you've talked a lot about some of the challenges in the country. And a Prensa Libre poll said that more than 80% of Guatemalans um, feel that in the past three years, things have gotten worse in the country. Um, and at the same time, the top concern that they raised was security. And I thought this was interesting, given all of the harsh statistics and difficult statistics we see about covering just even basic costs um, and, and economic issues and job concerns, um, and some of the things that you've raised, security is such an overwhelmingly huge issue. At the same time, we're seeing some of these candidates pledging some very strong security actions. And at the same time, talking in this regional context, we have next door Nayib Bukele, um, who has been suspending rights and, and doing mass arrests um, in a, in a clampdown that is to some degree being seen positively in his country, right? He's extremely popular. I'm curious, how do you see proposals, uh, from the candidates around this issue? And how do you see Guatemala in that Central American context um, of some of those security challenges? I see most of the candidates' proposals on security and on fighting against the gangs in Guatemala unrealistic and I would say in some terms discriminatory and, and really undemocratic. I'll tell you why. Because these gangs are, are integrated by a lot of youngsters who really don't have another chance in the country and in society and who really feel that have been expelled out of any, any kind of uh, prosperity and chance of well-being. Even if, if you catch them all and you put them in jail, what is going to prevent that many more kids and youngsters are not going to, to start uh, looking for new ways of organization to, to commit crimes or look for any way to get money out of, of the people, extort them and, and really act against their neighbors. If they don't have a chance to get to school, if they don't have a chance to get proper education, I think that this is a more complex problem Guatemala lacks uh, social cohesion and social integration. And you have a lot of people, a lot of youngsters, living out of any kind of well-being and, and possibilities. They simply lack education. They lack health. They lack opportunities. Something that is a challenge, not just in Guatemala, but I can see in this case, um, we have many candidates and politicians who have... Um, been in politics for many years uh, or have been trying to become president for many years? And how do younger voters see this issue? How do younger voters see their country and, and what are the chances for change there? Many young Guatemalans look at politics and, and the political situation in the country with a lot of apathy and lack of enthusiasm. I'll tell you what, two million young Guatemalans simply didn't enroll to become voters in this election. That tells you a lot about how they simply don't have any hope or they think that uh, through democratic ways, there is no chance to, to make uh, a better country. Hmm. That's sad, isn't it? Yes, that is, very, that is very sad. That is very sad, but... But that also tells you about how uh, politicians are not being able to, well, to inspire these young Guatemalans. 
Yeah, it, it does make me wonder, though, it's, at some point, these young Guatemalans um, will have to, you know, as they get older, they'll they'll be the ones that have to decide how to lead their country. And the question will be, um, what sort of movements will they adopt or changes will they adapt to um, to do that? They seem to admire very much this Salvadorian president, Nayib Bukele, who is uh, very authoritarian and who rules the country with all the power in his hands. He is not democratic. However, they, they, most of the people think that he is very effective and that he is uh, delivering what people is asking. On the short term, I would say, I don't see that El Salvador is really uh, reaching a better economy, mm. a real development in the country. However, I am afraid that a lot of people think that this way of behaving, I mean, autocracy and on the other hand, lack of democracy might be more effective than what we have had for the last, let's say, 30 years. I do have one final question. We've been talking a lot about the challenges in Guatemala, about the challenges um, in terms of this election. Is there something that gives you optimism about what might change, about what about something that could happen in the future? Is there an opportunity you see uh, for things to improve? I wish I could say that I find many, many signs of hope myself, but there are just a few. Still very, very young and very weak uh, organizations among young people, among new politicians in, in the countryside. And I would say the search of new leaders that might be able to grow out their organizations and, and convey their message to, to most of our society. I think that we also have, uh, in my profession in, in journalism, I get to see that there are many, many young journalists who really want to do a very uh, professional job and they have been very inspired by technology and by the comparison with other democracies and with the media that, that is coming out in developed countries. And I think that uh, we are going to keep having, I, I, I hope, a very strong social movement that is going to be able in the future to come up and, and do the fight for democracy. Muchísimas gracias, Juan Luis. Fue mi gusto. Thank you very much. Thanks for being with us today. I'm your host, Karin Zesses. This episode was produced by executive producer Luisa Lemmy and associate producer John Orbach. The music in this podcast is El Arpómetro de Carlos by P. Colón and H. Martínez, performed by Ángel Tolosa for America Society. Check the podcast notes for links to watch the full video and find out about upcoming concerts at musicoftheamericas.org. For a poll tracker and explainer on Guatemala's upcoming elections, head to as-coa.org 2023. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Give us a follow on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode of Latin America in Focus. And we'd also love to get your feedback. So get in touch by emailing latamfocus at as-coa.org. And if you didn't catch that, check the podcast notes. Mm-hmm.